I often get asked which is the best sacred cactus species to grow. This I cannot answer, as it's down to personal preferences. Instead, in this video, I will share with you which is my favorite sacred cactus species and why. Is it San Pedro, the Peruvian torch, the Bolivian torch, peyote, or one of the fat trichoceros species? Watch this video to find out. I start by saying that I won't be comparing species based upon their looks, because they all look equally beautiful. I would not be able to say that one species looks any better than another. It's very subjective, and quite frankly, they all deserve a 10 out of 10 for their looks. Therefore, I'll be basing myself more on practical aspects and on how easy they are to grow. I'll start with my least favorite species, which is, believe it or not, peyote. Don't get me wrong, I love the looks of peyotes. In fact, I'm absolutely fascinated by their beauty. But to me, as a species, it has many downsides that columnar cacti don't have. First off, peyotes are very slow growing. Of course, you can graft them to speed up the process, up to the point of getting a full-size adult plant in just over a year. But otherwise, it's a very slow process. I know that slow growth is not necessarily a bad thing, but I am the impatient type. That being said, this is only for me a minor issue. More of a concern to me is that they are considerably more fragile than Tuchocerus cacti. First off, they are more susceptible to bugs, especially red spider mites, and those happen to be the hardest species of insects to eradicate. The lack of spines on peyotes, as well as the fact that they grow close to the ground, also means they are often eaten by animals. Some of my dad's peyotes have been partially eaten by snails, for instance, but for some reason, snails have never damaged any of his San Pedro's, even though they are often found on them. Peyotes being desert plants, they are also very sensitive to overwatering. Water them as often as San Pedro's and they will rot. That is especially true if you grow them outdoors in the winter where the soil takes forever to dry. Leaving them for two weeks or more in cold wet soil is usually a death sentence for a peyote. And once a peyote starts to rot, it's often too late to make cuts to try and save it, because it's such a small plant. By the time you realize the plant doesn't look quite right, it could already be completely liquefied on the inside. That's why I prefer Tuchocerus cacti over peyotes. They are not as fragile. They don't rot as easily. And if they do rot, you can usually cut out the rotten parts and there will still be plenty of plants left to be saved. Also, insects on Tuchocerus cacti are not as much of an issue. The worst insect species, the red spider mites, are rarely seen on San Pedro. Or even if they are, it's on young plants and that is quite uncommon. The bugs that most frequently harm Tuchocerus plants are scale insects, mealybugs, and thrips. Scale insects are by far the most common of the three. Thankfully, they are very easy to get rid of. Just wipe them off. They will usually come back after a few days, in which case, wipe them off again and again until they're all gone. Mealybugs are much more contagious than scale insects, but in my experience, it's possible to totally get rid of them without using harsh chemicals. You can wipe them off with isopropyl alcohol. And just like with scale insects, you will have to repeat the treatment until they are all gone. As for thrips, they are the least common pest of the three and the hardest to eradicate, although not as challenging as red spider mites. I've been planning to make videos on these different species of pests for a long time, so hopefully I'll get around to do it this year. Another reason why I prefer Tuchocerus cacti over peyotes is that they grow super fast. They are among the fastest growing cacti you can find, except for the fat Tuchocerus species, which grow slow. The three most commonly known sacred columnar cacti are the San Pedro, the Bolivian torch, and the Peruvian torch. Some strains of these three species can grow up to a couple of feet in just a year once they are adult. And that's for each stem, bearing in mind that the large plant can have several stems. Out of these three classics, which do I prefer? Well, for a start, I'm not a big fan of spines, and for that reason, neither the Peruvian torch nor the Bolivian torch would make the top of my list. I love the looks of them, but I just don't like getting hurt by spines. Having said that, one of the main reasons I often get stabbed is the lack of space on my terraces. My cacti are just too crammed together. Often, I am watering plants, and I don't pay attention that there may be a cactus with long spines just inches behind me. That's when I get hurt. Still. There are strains of Bolivian torch with fewer spines. Those I can usually handle and repot with bare hands. 
I'm just careful to place my fingers in between the spines. But when handling a strain of Bolivian torch that has a lot of spines, or any strains of Peruvian torch, I will need to wrap a magazine around it. The two torches grow fast, possibly more so the Bolivian than the Peruvian. Do they grow any faster than San Pedro? No, I don't think so. I think that varies more on the strain than on the species. Both Bolivian and Peruvian torch require the same growing conditions as San Pedro, but I don't always find them quite as resistant. The Bolivian torch is rumored to be slightly more fragile and subject to rot than other plants in the Trucoceros genus. Although to be honest, this is not something I've noticed on my plants. I think that may be true for some strains of Bolivian torch, but the ones I currently have in my collection don't really seem to have that problem. One thing I've noticed, however, on various strains of Peruvian torch is that they can be more sensitive to spot rot, or whatever you may want to call it. Spot rot is not a big issue and hardly ever threatens the life of the plant, so you don't even need to act on it. It can happen very easily when you try to fertilize these plants, more so with some types of fertilizers than others, but it can also happen for no apparent reason, especially to plants that grow in the shade. Another negative point of those very spiny cacti is that if this plant has scale insects or mealybugs, those won't be easy to mechanically remove with a toothbrush. But then again, if you act on them when they first appear, that shouldn't be overly difficult. They only become a pain to remove if you let an infestation develop due to neglect. In conclusion, the two torches are awesome plants and I love them, but they're not my number one choice due to their spines. Of course, some of you love spines and for that reason will prefer these two species. As you might have guessed, my favorite sacred cactus species are Trichocerus with small spines or no spines at all, and that narrows it down to Trichocerus pacanoi and Trichocerus copulucola. The pacanoi, commonly called San Pedro, can sometimes have long spines, but generally speaking, they are much shorter than on a Bolivian or a Peruvian torch, and also, there are a lot less of them. There are even some pacanoi strains that are spineless or very nearly spineless, a good example of that being Sardaniola A3. A huge variety of Pacano strains exist, so you can really get one that fits your needs. Some people prefer short spines, other long spines, or a bluish tone, or fast growth, or a fatter body, etc. You can really fine tune it to your personal preferences. Personally, I like to collect a great variety of strains, as I find it a lot more fun than having many plants of only one or two strains. Of course, there's also the Scopulucola, which is spineless. Truly an amazing species, although much harder to come by than San Pedro. Check my recent video on Scopulucola Goliath if you haven't seen it yet. Goliath is one of the latest additions to my collection and it's already one of my faves. So far in this video we've seen the typical classic sacred cacti, the little round peyote, the big three columnar cacti composed of the San Pedro, the Bolivian torch and the Peruvian torch, as well as the slightly less known but extremely sought after Scopulucola. But this video will not be complete without mentioning the fat trichocerus species. So what's my personal take on those? Well, for a start, I'm not too keen on how much they weigh. You just can't imagine how heavy they can get until you've tried to carry one. I once brought home some large cuttings of Terskeki and Atacamensis, and carrying them to my car all by myself was not easy. Strangely enough, I did not get hurt by the spines. I found the Terskeki spines not too bad to deal with. As for the Atacamensis spines, they are quite harmless, since they are rather flexible. At least those on the upper part of the plant, as it can have some real nasty spines lower down the stem. That being said, the spines of these plants and their weight don't really bother me that much. What frustrates me more is the slow speed at which they grow. You really have to be patient with these plants. They don't grow as slow as peyote, but they do take a lot of time. It may not be an issue for you, but personally, I get excited to see new growth on a plant, and to barely see it change over the month kind of frustrates me. Thankfully, the growth of a fat Trichocerus can be sped up by crossing it with a faster growing species like the San Pedro. Not only will the offspring grow much faster, but also they won't be as fat and heavy. The Terskeki Pacanoi hybrid seeds I've produced are starting to grow into amazing plants, not as wild as Terskeki but still much fatter than San Pedro, and they are also surprisingly fast growing, like I've shown you recently in my small container series, episode 12. Terskeki times Pacanoi, meaning Terskeki is the mother, seems to give a lot of wild, monstrous and variegated plants. Whereas the opposite Pacanoi times Terskeki, 
meaning Pacanoid is the mother, produces what is shaping up to be some Super San Pedro's on steroids. I can't wait to see how they will develop over time, I already know I'm gonna love these plants. As far as flowering is concerned, fat Tucaceros species don't seem to flower as much and as often as San Pedro, Bolivian Torch or Peruvian Torch. I haven't had any Terskeki flowers last year and no Atacamensis flowers for the past two or three years. And when they do flower, they typically only have one or two flowers. I have limited experience with fat Tucaceros species. So please take all my observations on those with a pinch of salt. But to me, it also seems that they are kind of indestructible. They can handle large amounts of sun, better than San Pedro, Bolivian Torch or Peruvian Torch. Not just that, but I find that they are also more resistant to pests and rot. That applies to both adult plants and seedlings. None of the Tezkeki Pacanoi hybrids I've grown from seeds have had any casualties. Of course, there can always be exceptions. Years ago, various seed dealers were selling Verde Magnanus seeds that were badly labeled as Cupulucola, and those grew to be very fragile plants, with rot spots appearing on them very easily. Before I wrap up on the fat sugar series, a special mention to the Taquimbalensis, which is quite different from the other fat sugar series species. For a start, it's not that fat. Also, it grows quite fast. It has spines that are really dangerous, even more so than a Bridget Sea or a Perivianus. And lastly, it flowers every year without fail. Here again, I'm not sure if all of that is specific to the Taquimbalensis species or if it's just that strain that I have access to, which I am showing you here. There you have it. That's how I feel about all the different sacred cacti. My two favorite species have to be the San Pedro and Scopulucola, mostly due to their very short or inexistent spines. I also like the fact that they grow fast and that rot and insects are not an issue. Keep in mind that my personal preferences do not take into consideration how psychoactive the cacti are. Some other people have this as a priority, and I have noticed that often they tend to prefer Bolivian torch over San Pedro or Peruvian torch, as they view it as the most reliably active of the big three. Is there some truth to that, or is it just an urban legend? I'll give you my opinion, first looking at the San Pedro, and then at the Peruvian torch. In the case of San Pedro, I think that the reputation for being sometimes less active comes from the fact that the huge majority of plants sold as San Pedro in North America are pieces, which are very weak. Also very common in North America are crosses between PC and true San Pedro, which will result in a plant more active than a PC, but not as active as a true San Pedro that would have zero PC genetics. Of course, it's also possible to find genuine San Pedros in North America with no PC genetics, but they are much, much harder to come by. I believe that is the reason why many people in North America tend to favor Bolivian torches over San Pedro. Here in Europe, on the other hand, San Pedro is the preferred species at ceremonies. You see, in Europe you won't find any pieces, which means that all San Pedros here are the true kind. So when people on Reddit state that Bridgetsis are more active than San Pedros, that is probably only true in North America, where pieces are absolutely everywhere. And if you're wondering why only that one specific strain of San Pedro, the PC, is so weak, out of hundreds if not thousands of San Pedro strains, it's probably because the PC is not even San Pedro, it just looks similar. A lot of collectors think that the PC is not Trichocerus pacanoi, but instead a different species named Trichocerus riomisquensis, which originates from Bolivia. If you want to learn more about the PC, I have a video on the topic. And what about the Peruvian torch? Where does that reputation come from that it could sometimes be less active? Well, here the story rhymes with the one about the PC and San Pedro. It just happens that some plants sold as Trichocerus peruvianus are in fact Trichocerus cuscoensis, which is supposed to be a considerably less active species. Cuscoensis also looks similar to the Peruvian torch, which is why some sellers prefer to sell it as Peruvian torch, as that sells better. Thankfully, Trichocerus peruvianus and Cuscoensis can be told apart. To conclude on this topic, I think the San Pedro, Bolivian Torch and Peruvian Torch are probably all in the same ballpark when it comes to mescaline concentration. As long as you're talking about real San Pedro, not the PC kind, no crosses between PC and true Pacanoi, 
And as long as you're talking about real Peruvian torch, not Cusco and Cis passed as Peruvian torch. Of course, there can be differences in mescaline concentrations, but probably more between strains than between these three species. And in any case, that's not the reason why we should love these plants. They look awesome, they grow fast, and they have an amazing history as sacred plants of the Americas. This ancient history, dating back thousands of years, fascinates many collectors and drives them to own these magnificent sacred plants, without necessarily eating them. My dad, for instance, has never taken any psychoactive substance, apart from coffee, chocolate and a bit of alcohol on social occasions, but he loves these plants, not just for their looks but also for their historical significance. The same applies to my mentor Francis, who told me he's never eaten San Pedro or peyote, even though he's been growing them for nearly 80 years now. I hope that this video entertained you and that you've learned something from it. Before I sign off, I'd like to remind you that if you want to buy seeds of all the species I've talked about in this video, always fresh and pollinated seeds, or seedlings grown from the same seeds, you can send me an email mentioning your country and I will reply with information, prices and photos. My email address can be found in the description of this video. I will also make it appear on the screen now. It's sanpedromastery at protonmail.com. Please also make sure that you are subscribed to my channel as you don't want to miss any of the exciting videos that I have in mind for the future. All for now my friends and I will see you soon with another video.